Thanks everyone for taking time out of your day to hear about ergonomics for spay neuter vets. So to start with, here's an outline of today's presentation. We'll start by talking about data on discomfort in spay and neuter vets. And next we'll cover ergonomics and setting up the physical space in surgery. And then we'll move on to ergonomics in the manual path of surgery. And finally, we'll spend a little time talking about instruments and needles and then finish up with movement and posture during surgery. So is there even a problem? Is ergonomics and pain something we need to spend time thinking about and stay a neuter veterinarian? So in order to figure this out, in 2011, I designed an online survey and collected responses from veterinarians who currently or previously performed spay neuter surgeries at least four hours a week. And I asked about hand and body pain, um, whether that pain affected their work or activities, whether the pain was related to spay neuter, and whether they ever had to miss work because of the pain. And I also asked about interventions that they had tried during their surgery day, as well as outside of surgery, and about job stress and their satisfaction at work. So here you can see the profile of the 219 people who responded to the survey. As you can see, there's a quite a range in experience and workload, uh, but overall, from what I've seen, this population is pretty representative of the population of people working in the spay and neuter field. And when I looked at the prevalence of pain, I found that 99% of the in the survey had experienced some musculoskeletal discomfort in the past month. 98% had body pain, and just over three quarters had hand or wrist pain. So this sounds really alarming, but other surveys of vets in a variety of practice areas have shown nearly as high a prevalence of discomfort. And there's a lot of variability in the severity of discomfort that people experience and the number of body regions that were uncomfortable. So these were people who responded that they had any amount of pain in the last month. So some veterinarians had worked full time for many years in spay neuter with relatively little discomfort and others were uncomfortable with a much lighter workload. This slide is showing the body regions where spay and neuter veterinarians most commonly experience discomfort. As you can see, the low back, neck, and shoulders are the most likely to be uncomfortable. Low back pain is pretty common among humans, so the high proportion of vets reporting low back pain in the past month is actually in line with other surveys of people. However, the rate of neck, shoulder, and upper back pain is about 40% higher than what is reported in other surveys of veterinarians. And the only other surveys where these high rates of neck pain are actually in human surgeons. So this next slide is showing the areas of the hands and wrists where spay and neuter veterinarians most commonly experience discomfort. And um, we found that the right thumb and wrist were the most commonly painful areas. And this was actually true of the lefties as well as the right-handed vets. So one big question in this research was, what are the workplace factors that contribute to pain? The top predictors of pain were the hours per week in surgery and the number of years working in the field of spay neuter. And the least important factors were the number of surgeries per day and the speed of each surgery. However, all these factors only explained a small amount of the pain score, so most of the differences between individuals would have to be explained by individual variability, genetics, activities outside of work, and other factors that we may not even be thinking about. And many studies in many fields have shown that people who have higher job stress or lower job satisfaction experience more work-related pain. In this study, nearly every measure of discomfort increased as people had higher stress and lower satisfaction. So we can't say from this survey that this is a direct cause and effect process, although there are some other studies that have suggested it can be cause and effect. It may be best to think about pain, stress, and low job satisfaction as a cycle that feeds on itself. So as you're trying to solve ergonomic problems in your workplace, take time to consider that working on psychosocial issues may actually improve people's physical comfort as well. Now onto physical ergonomics and how to set up the surgery workspace. First, I want to start by encouraging you to take photos or video of yourself in surgery in order to evaluate your surgical ergonomics and body posture. 
It's really hard to pay attention to your body posture while you're in the middle of surgery. Even if you're trying to pay attention to postures and positions, you may not even be able to know or evaluate your posture without a view from the outside. So by taking video, you can later watch yourself and find problems that you can then make a special point of changing during your next surgery. You can prop a phone on a box of gloves, tape it to an IV pole, tape it to the surgery light, or use a tripod. In the picture here, I set this video up of myself from above and behind because I was having shoulder and upper back pain after surgery days, and this helped me figure out when I was tensing up so I could work on that. So the physical environment includes things like the height of your surgery table and how you position your patient and the objects in your space. These factors influence the way you use your body and changing them doesn't have to be difficult or expensive. In this first example, the surgery table is too high so the surgeon has to raise her shoulders and adduct or raise her elbows in order to reach the patient. This puts strain on the upper body, especially the neck and shoulders. In the second picture, the surgery table is too low, so the surgeon has to lean forward in order to reach the patient. This could place strain on the neck, upper back, and lower back, and perhaps also on the shoulders. When a surgery table is adjusted correctly and comfortably, the surgeon can stand with a relaxed upper body and arm posture. In general, the easiest table height for a relaxed posture is one in which the hands fall about 5 to 10 centimeters or about two to four inches below the elbows. So this means that the table height will have to be adjusted between large deep body dogs and small patients like cats in order to keep the surgeon's upper body in this relaxed position. Of course, I know that not everyone has access to tables that adjust adequately, but this doesn't have to mean that you're condemned to upper body strain. Low tech solutions like step stools or platforms, bed risers, blocks, and other boosters can help get you and your patient to a comfortable height. Another positioning issue that comes up sometimes is that a tiny patient is placed in the middle of a surgery table so that the surgeon has to reach a long way to the patient or bend forward. A lot of reaching and bending can put strain on the upper and lower back and shoulders. If you have a surgery table that you can lean your body against as you work, you may find that it's comfortable to work with a small patient in this position. However, if your table moves when you lean on it, then you may be straining yourself to reach like this. If you do find yourself bending and reaching forward to reach a patient in the middle of the surgery table, consider just positioning the patient closer to you. And when we talk about positioning, also remember to look at other objects in the surgery space. Are there objects that the surgeon has to work to avoid or has to work to reach? So this surgeon in this picture is having to lift her arm and elbow way up out of the way to avoid the instrument tray. It's great having the instruments nearby and in easy reach, but this tray would work a lot better if it was lower or further away, or if the instruments were on the table or even between the patient's back legs. Most stay neuter vets stand for surgery. It's what we're taught in school, and many of us don't think about sitting unless we have to because of injury or for comfort during pregnancy. But research with human surgeons showed that they were less fatigued if they either sat for surgery or alternated between sitting and standing. If you haven't tried sitting during surgery, it may be something to consider at least some of the time to increase comfort during surgery and at the end of the surgery day. I sit for my cat neuters, and I alternate neuter and spay, so that gets me at least moving up and down during the day. So sometimes sitting for a very simple surgery may be the way to get yourself learning to do it. And sitting for surgery is pretty straightforward when it comes to a small patient because it's possible to use a standard stool or chair and get close enough to the patient to remain in a comfortable posture. However, it can be more challenging to stay in a comfortable position when doing surgery on a large, deep body patient. The surgeon sitting on a standard stool or chair may have to raise her shoulders and elbows to clear the patient's body. In this scenario, it's not possible to lower the table or raise the surgeon's height because the surgeon's legs are already in contact with the underside of the table. But there is a solution to this. Using alternatives like a saddle-shaped seat or a sit-stand stool can help by allowing the surgeon to remain close to the patient while achieving a better relative height. 
And here are some pictures of dental students using a standard chair versus a saddle-shaped chair. And the type of seating, as you can see, really shapes the way these students use their whole body. Okay, on to some other aspects of the physical environment. Research shows that floor mats can decrease lower limb discomfort and fatigue. They sometimes get credit for helping relieve back pain, but that isn't supported by the research that I've read. The perfect mat will be one that's not too hard and not too soft. The best mat will be a matter of personal preference. So you want to try out various mats whenever you get the chance. You want something that's cleanable and non-slip. And um, you also may want to look online for free sample mat or one month trial period from companies that sell them to hospitals or offices so that once you have one in mind, you can try it out. As with floor mats, there's no perfect surgery shoe. In general, wearing shoes with cushioned soles while in surgery will be the most comfortable, even if you're already standing on a floor mat. Some studies of industrial workers found that people who wore different shoes on different days were less likely to have heart fasciitis than those wearing the same shoes every day. Um, and cushioned athletic shoes or rubber cloths can be good choices. Now let's move on to talking about surgery itself. Stay and neuter surgery involves a combination of repetitive movements that can at times require force or may be performed with awkward positioning of the hands and wrists. Each of these factors alone is only moderately associated with pain, but put together, there's a strong association with hand and wrist pain. So in any high volume workplace, there will be repetition. Fortunately, many of the high volume surgery techniques that we learn can reduce some of the repetition. For example, Pedicle ties mean fewer suture knots. Shorter incisions mean fewer sutures placed and fewer knots tied. And efficient technique in general means less wasted motion. Sustained awkward or tiring positions can lead to discomfort. The pinch grip used for thumb forceps is a common example of an awkward, tiring grip. Some state or vets minimize the use of thumb forceps during closure. This reduces the trauma to the skin edges and also reduces strain from the pinch grip, so it can be a win-win situation. Other awkward or extreme postures are rarely necessary in spay-neuter surgery, but they may be something that you're using without really realizing it. This is a great reason to get video of yourself doing surgery. Here are some awkward spay pictures showing a large amount of wrist flexion or extension. These positions are all okay as long as they're comfortable and not sustained or repeated for a lot of time. If they become uncomfortable or if the surgeon is spending a lot of time in extreme or awkward positions, then it's time to think of other ways to perform the same surgical task. And here are some arm positions during suturing that are near the extremes of their ranges of motion in supination and pronation twisting of the lower arm and in the ulnar deviation or wrist tip of the forearm. Nothing inherently wrong with having these positions that are at the end of their range of motion, but if they become uncomfortable or inefficient, or if they're sustained or repeated often, then the surgeon will need to try alternative positions to achieve their surgical task. So there are a lot of different ways that spay neuter vets hold their needle holders. Some spay neuter vets swear by using the palm grass, whereas others have never used it. It turns out that the amount of muscle use and the range of motion is so variable between different vets that I can't really make generalizations about muscle strain between the different graphs. This is another case where photos and video of yourself are helpful. If the motions of surgery and grasping instruments are uncomfortable, then that may be a cue for you to consider learning a different grasp style and seeing if the changes in grasp take strain off the uncomfortable body area. In addition to repetitive motion and awkward position, forceful motions are the other contributor to hand and wrist pain. The most common times when a stay neuter vet has to use force is during suturing and knot tying and during the castration of large male dogs. Choosing a suture size that's bigger than what you need for a given surgery means that on every throw of every knot, you'll be applying more pounds of force to your ligaments and muscles. Over the course of the surgery day, that's hundreds of times that you're applying that extra force. So in addition to being good surgical practice to select appropriate suture size, it's also good ergonomic practice. With the big dog neuter, the spay neuter vet can be using a combination of force and awkward posture to exteriorize the testicle. 
As you can see in the illustration, the surgeon has to have a firm grasp and may be pulling with a substantial amount of ulnar deviation, so the wrist is canted towards the pinky finger. This can be challenging for people with discomfort anywhere in the upper quarter of their body, from hand, wrist, and elbow to shoulder, neck, and upper back. Some alternatives that decrease this strain could include open castration, sharply dissecting the fibrous attachments around the vaginal tunic and between the tunic and the sub tissue, or using a hemostat to clamp the cord just proximal to the testis once the spermatic cord is exposed to provide a more favorable grip for applying traction rather than grasping the testis itself. There are also times when surgical technique can change your whole body posture. In this illustration, the vet is doing a continuous sub closure from left to right. In order to position the needle, she's twisted around, leaning over, and has a raised elbow. And here is me doing the same thing. It wasn't until I took video that I realized how awkward this is and how easy the solution could be. Just by doing the same closure from right to left rather than left to right, the surgeon can avoid all the twisting and leaning. The moral is, if you're doing something really awkward, there's probably another solution that's a lot smoother and easier. Here's another example of an awkward moment in surgery. I'm the same cat as during my last picture. Um, and I have my surgery pack on my left, but I'm reaching with my right hand. If I plan to head in positioning my instruments at the beginning of surgery, or if I learn to use my left hand more effectively, I could avoid some of these awkward moments. So I just wanted to say a little about instruments and needles. It should not take a lot of force to open and close the ratchets on needle holders. If you're using stiff instruments over the course of the day, that can add up to a lot of extra force. In order to reduce the force required by instruments and needle holders, make sure that you're using good protocols for cleaning and processing your instruments. Get scissors and needle holders sharpened and get jaws replaced when they get dull or smooth. Discard needles when they are dull. It takes extra force to use a dull needle and extra tissue trauma for the patient. And finally, if you have a chance to make purchasing decisions, choose instruments that don't require a lot of force to open and close. And finally, I want to talk about posture and movement during the surgery day and how they affect your pain and fatigue level. We can't know if these surgeons are using their body in this way because of the way their surgery room is set up or because of habit or unawareness of their posture or all of the above. And maybe these are brief positions during surgery and not sustained, but if these postures are sustained through the surgery day, these individuals are likely to experience some pain as a result. In small animal surgery, we can achieve a fairly neutral posture except for our neck position. A neutral neck position would involve a flexion of less than 10 degrees, but for a surgeon it's often 20 to 30 degrees. In this picture, I have a neck angle approaching 40 degrees. It may not be possible to avoid this extreme neck flexion in this work, and the important thing will be getting out of this posture between surgeries to allow the muscles to release and stretch. Other surgical postures to look for can be twisted or asymmetrical postures. If a surgeon maintains an asymmetrical or twisted posture, that can lead to uneven muscle use and strain and discomfort at the end of the surgery day. However, varying position during the surgery day is a good thing, so if the surgeon balances the twist in one direction over time with a twist in the other direction, then she may not experience strain from the posture. In this case, I think the surgeon might be more comfortable with a footstool to rest your foot on. So this is another important takeaway from the day. Move during the surgery day. Between surgeries, take a few seconds to change your position. Roll your neck and your shoulders, stretch, walk a few steps. Research has shown that taking a 20-second break every 20 minutes can increase your comfort and decrease fatigue after a day of surgery, and it can sustain your surgical performance and accuracy better through the surgery day. We are fortunate in spay and neuter that we have short enough surgery times that we can use the end of each surgery as a cue to move a little. We are doing the hours-long surgeries where we would need to set an alarm to remind us to move every 20 minutes. So take a moment when you switch from one surgery to the next to break the muscular tension that you hold during surgery. And we don't necessarily think of or talk about stay and neuter surgery as an activity that requires physical fitness or work hardening, but it does. As you do this work, your ligaments adapt, and if you give them the recovery time they need between use, they can do this adaptation. 
Gradual increases in work hours rather than starting off with a full-time schedule may be more likely to lead to well-adapted ligaments rather than injury and strain. And finally, physical activity outside of work is important to reducing physical discomfort while at work. There are not specific activities or exercises that research says are best, and it will likely vary between individuals. The key is simply being active and moving.